Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, we're going to be speaking to Kathy O'Dowd, who is the first South African to climb Mount Everest and the first woman to summit Mount Everest from both sides. Today, the episode is going to be all about adventure, life, the journey. We also discuss fears, planning, and waiting for the stars align. And we also cover off money as well and how she flip-flops between either staying at home or wanting to go away and do big expeditions. Lots of information in this episode, so please do enjoy. Stay listening till the very end because there's so much to update you on from what happened at the Commando Challenge to the Women in Adventure Expo. And I've also got some incredibly exciting news to share with you all. Enjoy this episode. Hi, Kathy. How are you? Hi, Sarah. It's great to speak to you. Oh, it's so good. Now, where are you based at the moment, Kathy? I live in a tiny little country the size of a postage stamp called Andorra, which is in the Pyrenees Mountains between Spain and France. Oh, wonderful. That sounds absolutely amazing. But I, now I knew you actually grew up in South, I was going to say South America, but South Africa. But what was it like for you growing up in South Africa? Were you sporty? Was mountaineering a part of your life? No, it wasn't. And I wish it had been. I mean, I'd, I'd love to have, I don't know, grown up in the Swiss Alps and been on skis by the time I was 18 months old and those sort of things. I grew up in a place enormously flat, city of Johannesburg in the suburbs. I had parents who quite liked sort of doing little day walks on our summer holidays. We used to go down to the coast every year and there was a little range of mountains just just back from the sea called the Otaniqua. And walking in those forests with my parents is kind of the closest I came. Then as a teenager, I got a, a bit of a chance to go to some summer camps in the Drakensberg. So that's the first time I ever really went camping or up into biggish mountains. But I, I never, sport didn't work for me. I went to the sort of school that was modeled on, a, you know, a British public school. And they were trying to turn us out to be little ladies. And we did terribly conventional team sport. And I was terrible at all of it. Uh, and it was just depressing. So by the time I was a teenager, I'd kind of labeled myself as being uh, academic, not sporty, you know, a bit, bit, bit square, really. And I took that feeling into early adulthood. But I had tried rock climbing once at one of these summer camps. And I liked that. And I liked camping. I liked hiking. So as soon as I got to university and I discovered they had a rock climbing club, I joined it. And from there, I was off. I just thought rock climbing was amazing. And I think part of the reason is that it's not competitive. I've never done well with, you know, for me to win, you have to lose. Or for you to win, I have to lose. Either way, I don't, I don't like it. Whereas rock climbing and later uh, skiing and ski mountaineering, alpinism, it's physically challenging, it's mentally challenging, and it's utterly, utterly personal. Yeah. Do you know what I think is really interesting there is how you said you ended up labeling yourself even very young. You said, you know, I'm academic, I'm not sporty, sports didn't work for you. And I think so many young girls can grow up and have that. They almost label themselves at such a young age. And it's like you said, it can be very depressing if you're not good at the traditional sports, the hockey, the lacrosse, or you don't fit into mm -hmm. being that little ladies. But what I think is really interesting is actually that you continued to get involved in it at university because, you know, most people, I don't know what it was like sort of back when, back when you were going to university, either get there and think, thank goodness, I no longer have to do anything active at all. I can just focus on my social life and just focus on my academics. But so you're loving the rock climbing. How did that lead to, did that lead to your love of the mountains or what sort of happened next? Well, I think, the two were, were intricately linked anyway. This is when rock climbing only happened outdoors. <laughs> I mean, I'm still slightly befuddled 
by uh, young younger people who start rock climbing indoors at you know gyms and climbing walls and things, and then go like, oh no, I don't feel ready for the great outdoors yet. And it's like, what? We had no choice. That was where you went. I remember my first uh, what we called beginners meet. There'd be a big weekend uh, at the beginning of each university year, and we'd go out to this. It was basically a range of hills that had a set of streams that had cut gorges, what in South Africa we called kloofs. And we'd go out to one of those and camp and go rock climbing. And that's how you started. So it was intricately involved in being outdoors all the time. And I loved that. I never was a party girl. And I wasn't, I was desperately shy as well. So kind of going out in this group on the weekends was a nice way to have something to look forward to on the weekends. I liked the sort of camaraderie of, of rope teams because on one hand, you're quite closely linked with the person you're working with. You manage the safety between the two of you and you are you know, literally trusting your safety and in some cases your life to the person who's on the other end of your rope. But on the other hand, it's also deeply personal because in the moments of climbing your partner is is on the ground or attached somewhere controlling your safety line and you're involved in this very quiet personal intimate challenge as you try and weave your way up this rock face so it was an it's an oddly good sport for someone who is introverted and not terribly socially confident but also but, academic as well, because it's it's almost like the problem solving of rock climbing as you're going up. Oh, exactly. And people don't get that. All of the things I do is like, oh, you know, it's all so physical. And it's in, actually intensely mental. It's puzzle solving. Whether it's just a rock climb that's 15 meters long or whether it's, a, you know, it's an enormous mountain in some remote corner of the world. It's about having an environment that you can't fully know and you can't fully anticipate what's going to happen to in, within it. It's not, it's not entirely under your control. And then you've got a set of resources. Some come from within you, what you're capable of doing. Some are simply a happenstance that there's a hold here in a rock or there's a, a crack there in the rock face or there's a, a way up this mountain on a snow canal, whatever it is. And you put these two things together, what you can do, what the situation provides you, and then you try and work out a way to get to whatever, it, whatever you're trying to get to. And it's not just that you're trying to get to the top. It's not about conquering things and standing on summits. I mean, that's fun, but it's not the real point of it. It's just about traveling through this landscape in ways that satisfy you. And sometimes – it becomes just about getting yourself safely out because it's it's not going to plan. And the satisfaction of a well-planned retreat is enormous when things were going wrong around you and you or you and your companions together saw it coming, worked out a plan, changed, retreated, got out safely. That can be as, as satisfying as, as getting to the top of anything can be. So it's not all success or failure, at least not for me. It's about it's about journeying through these landscapes and doing it safely and successfully. Oh, abs absolutely. I mean, there's uh, there's a couple of really interesting experiences which are talked about on your website, which I'd love to go into um, in more detail. But let's just talk about Everest because it is it is the big one. It's the mountain. <laughs> it's the mountain that people are almost obsessed with. There was you know recently a movie which came out called. Everest, which was you know, incredibly visual, talking about um, you know the American Scott Fisher, the New Zealander, New Zealander Rob Hall, um, and what happened during that Everest season. And I know that you were there as well. But if we could just go back and maybe like, how did you end up on an Everest trip? Because this was back in um, the 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 nineteen nineties, and I think it would just be quite fascinating to see how that transition took place yes it's again not the obvious journey that people tend to assume so I had no interest in Everest 
Uh, it was not a childhood dream. It was not an objective I was working my way up towards in any sense. It frankly just never occurred to me that uh, I, I could potentially climb a mountain like Everest. The, my journey was much more curiosity-driven step by step. So it started with rock climbing, you know, so, so single pitch, one rope length rock climbing. Then I got into what we call multi-pitch. So now you're looking at a wall that's a couple of hundred meters high. Uh, so it's going to take much longer to climb. It's much more committing. Then I was curious about what it would be like to go into an actual big mountain range. I remember reading a book, one that I, I highly recommend uh, for any woman trying to get into mountaineering. And it's the story of the first all-woman expedition to the Himalaya. It was an American uh, expedition and in the 1970s. And they had a wonderful quote that went with it, a woman's place is on the face. Uh, and Arlene Bloom, well worth reading for an insight into what it was like being a woman trying to break into this very macho world of, of big mountain climbing. So having read that, for the first time it occurred to me that bigger mountains might be interesting. So I managed, uh, I got a trip to the Ruins Ori, which are in Central Africa. This kind of the, the highest peak, it's the third highest peak in Africa. So they had some glaciers, very, very remote. I managed a trip to Bolivia to climb in the Andes up to 6,000 meters. I took, then I took a year off between university degrees and spent it in Europe. Uh, worked in the winter and spent the summer climbing in the Alps. And after that, I thought Himalaya. I just want to have been there. No particular mountain in mind, certainly not. Back then, the 8,000-meter peaks weren't even really a thing. Uh, I just wanted to have gone to the Himalaya, but it was hard. There, was no, there were no commercial expeditions at this point. So basically, you either had to have some friends and enough knowledge to put it together yourself, or you had to somehow get yourself invited on somebody else's expedition. And this is still South Africa, the end of the apartheid years, and then just after apartheid, there's not a great deal of money. There's not a great deal of experience. The few people who are doing expeditions are doing them with their friends, which is perfectly understandable. Uh, but it did mean that it, it seemed so difficult to find an opportunity. And then... I opened up a newspaper and there's this big front page story about South Africa's first Everest expedition. Uh, now, clearly, this is going to interest me. I read all, all the way through it. And uh, it's a group of men. A few of them I know vaguely. Some of them I don't know. But then there's this funny thing about they're looking for a woman to join the team and they're going to run a sort of selection procedure. And it did sound really odd. It sounded like a particularly stupid way to select a team member. So it sounded like a media, uh, what's the word? Uh, a media setup, effectively. Mm -hmm. But their pitch was that they were going to select a shortlist of six take them to Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa, on a kind of selection expedition, and then invite one of them to join the Everest team. So on one hand, I thought the whole thing sounded really fishy and thoroughly sexist, given all the men had been invited and the women were, were sort of, I don't know, doing some kind of bikini parade in front of the media to try and justify their place on the team. On the other hand, I thought, hey, free trip to Kilimanjaro. <laughs> <laughs> Because I figured I could probably make the short list of six. There were just so few women who actually had any real mountaineering experience in South Africa. So when I applied, I wasn't even thinking about Everest. I was thinking, I wonder if I can get myself to Kilimanjaro. That would be cool. 
<laughs> and then, of course, then the, this whole bizarre experience was off and rolling. And I got on the shortlist, went to Kilimanjaro, got invited to join the Everest team. The team turned out to be famously dysfunctional. Uh, this was the year of the Hollywood movie. So I was there for all those events that are actually in that movie. And I ended up getting to the top of Everest. <laughs> so it was uh, an extraordinary way to have ended up on Everest. Oh, goodness. I mean, it's just, it's, sometimes it's ridiculous how these opportunities come about. That that article, that first trip to, to Kilimanjaro and seeing, <laughs> seeing, you know, seeing what's happened and then suddenly you're there now it's it's it says on your website that while you're around you know you spent a lot of time around Everest that it was almost a degree in living what do you think you learned most about yourself from going on that expedition um really easy question Not, not, no, not, not, it's not actually terribly difficult because I, I have a strong sense of what were the two most important things that I learned. And the one is more sort of obvious than the other. So the one was that I was just capable of a whole lot more than I thought. You know, it had literally not occurred to me that I was a good enough climber to get up Everest. I didn't really know how hard Everest was. I approached that expedition in this slightly old-fashioned sense where you learned mountaineering by going on trips with people who were better than you and kind of as an apprentice, and then you worked your way up through this informal apprenticeship system. So I didn't expect to get anywhere close to the top of Everest. I thought of it as, cool, this is my first Himalayan expedition. I just go along, go as far as I can, learn everything that I can. And I kept on going until I was standing on the summit. So that was a surprise. And I really only thought or truly believed I was going to do it at about 8 a.m. on the morning of the summer day when I stood on the south summit, looked at the the famous knife edge ridge with a, a rock climb called the Hillary Step in the middle of it. And I looked at the ridge and I looked at the Hillary Step and I thought, I can do that. I'm going to I'm going to make this. So there was an enormous boost to my confidence, a realization that I was a better climber than I thought, that I was probably in general more competent than I thought. I think I'd spent a lot of my life being quite careful. I think I'm still careful in the sense that I've climbed for 30 years and I've had no serious injuries ever of any kind. Uh, And I'm happy to back off things. I'm happy not to succeed at something because I think this is no longer what I consider sensible or safe. So there's something to be said for being careful, but you can be too careful. So I got a big boost to my confidence. But there's something else that was really important, and it's, it's much less obvious. It's about failure. Now, you wouldn't think that that expedition was a failure. We got to the top. I I actually became the first South African to have climbed Everest. It sounds put like that, like this huge success. But two things went badly wrong. One was that early on we had enormous amount of team fighting, which led to some pretty well-known South Africans walking out on the team. And that led to some massively bad publicity back in South Africa. So this was kind of the first time a mountaineering expedition had ever caught the attention of the general public in South Africa. We're we're not a mountaineering culture. You know, we're about rugby, surfing, you know, football, cricket type of things. Uh, So everyone was now following this expedition like we were some kind of dysfunctional soap opera in the mountains. And then, of course, we ran into that enormous storm that they made the movie about. So now the the mountains getting worldwide media coverage. So that's the one thing that went wrong. All this infighting and controversy and then the media raking through the controversy for all the best bits. The other thing that went wrong is one of our team got killed on the descent. So that is an enormous tragedy in itself. But 
it then got fed into this already existing media shitstorm, basically. And I came home to this setup where all sorts of strangers had opinions about the expedition and the leader and me and what we did and what we should have done and, you know, whether we were selfish or not or suicidal or not or crazy or not. And it's just, ah. I grew up middle class, uh, the only daughter, by far the youngest child, uh, in some ways quite sheltered, very much the good girl. Wanted my parents to be proud, wanted my teachers to be proud, worked hard, didn't like failing at things because I was good at academics. I didn't have a great deal of experience with failing, but I also didn't do things where I thought I might fail. (laughs) And here I was in the middle of this vast public fracas failure, and it was awful. But it was also in the longer term really useful because I had no choice. I had to live through it. Uh, And I discovered that, yes, it's awful, but it doesn't go on forever. The world doesn't end. Mixed in with all the horrible stuff is a whole lot of opportunity because, you know, hey, countrywide publicity, that did result in a whole lot of things, an offer to write a book, a chance to start giving the corporate speeches that I still do all these years later. Uh, a chance to raise sponsorship for more expeditions. I mean, it, it in the mess, was an enormous amount of opportunity. And I still don't like failing, <laughs> but I'm much better at it than I used to be. And I'm much more prepared to try things and accept that as long as I get something valuable out of the experience of trying, it's okay if we don't get the, the result we were going for. And that's been really useful. It's allowed me to be much more adventurous, not just in my climbing, but in my entire life, about what I'm prepared to try and about feeling that if it doesn't work out the way I initially hoped, that's not somehow a terrible reflection on my character as a person. It's just the way stuff happens sometimes. Yeah. I mean, how strong you must have had to be. I mean, coming coming back, were you 26 or 27 at this point? 27. 20, you know, 27 years old, coming back to everyone's got an opinion about what you did, how you did it, even though they weren't there, they didn't have your view, didn't have your perspective. But I think what was really interesting is you talked about how people could almost perceive it as this massive, this massive mess and there's almost a no-win situation. There's just publicity everywhere, a lot of it not necessarily very positive, but it's what you... It's how you dealt with it. It's how you got through it. And it's how you moved forward on that. Now, you've had over 30 years climbing mountains around the world. And I know Everest is is just one of those mountains. When you look back at the various expeditions that you've done, which are, which are the other expeditions that stand out for you? Well, there are a set of them because... Again, it's not just about, at least for me, uh, it's not just about like the hardest or the most impressive or, or or the highest. I don't actually think I'm particularly goal orientated, despite, you know, mountaineering seeming like such an obvious goal orientated activity. Uh, I think I'm process orientated. I'm interested in, in the journey and journeys can be good for a set of different reasons. So probably the hardest thing I've ever done is being part of the team that did the first ascent of the Mazeno, of Nanga Parbat via the Mazeno Ridge. So Nanga Parbat is one of the 8,000-meter peaks. It's in Pakistan. The Mazeno Ridge is this astonishing nine-kilometer-long ridge, most of it sitting up at 7,000 meters. And no one had ever done it uh, all the way to the summit of Nanga Parbat. Six of us tried I didn't get to the top. Uh, only two of the six got to the top. The rest of us, we were part of the first summit bid, and then it was just it, it all got so risky uh, that at that point I was beyond my limit of what I thought was acceptable. Four of us backed off. Uh, and that's probably the hardest climbing I have ever done and the hardest I probably ever want to do. <laughs> it was like 
that felt way out there, like I was kind of punching above my grade a bit. But it was an extraordinary experience. It's just this astonishing ridge, uh, I don't know, hanging up there in the sky. So, you know, that that's kind of obvious as something big that that I'm proud of. But actually, some of my best expeditions have been ones where it took me by surprise. So another brilliant expedition was when I utterly failed to climb the nose on El Capitan. For years, I'd wanted to try uh, big wall climbing. So big wall is effectively where you're going to spend days on a rock face. And your people have seen the image of the of the hanging tent platform that you sleep on and it looks terribly scary and so on. Uh, it's not really. But I wanted to try that. And I went with a friend and we went to try a classic route called the Nose on El Capitan in Yosemite. And we got about two days up and it was astonishingly hot. We were climbing really badly. We were climbing too slowly. You've got to haul all your equipment with you, your food, your stove, the water. The water was just a killer. I couldn't move the haul bag on my own. I had to have Michael's help to move the damn thing. And it was awful. We weren't climbing. We were doing this stupid logistical nightmare in a vertical world. And I hated it. And so, so did he. Uh, so we abseiled off. We gave up, abseiled all the way back down to the ground, went and bought ourselves the classic guidebook to the Sierras, which is this mountain range uh, that runs between California and Nevada, jumped in the hire car and just went off. Uh, all the planning, months of planning was just dumped. And we started making up this new trip based on the guidebook and what we felt like doing and what the next day brought. And we had this stunning trip, just ticking off long classic climbs in the high Sierras. And I don't know, it was such fun because it was so, it was unexpected. Each day unfolded in ways we didn't know what was coming next. We were just using our, I kind of, our skill set plus opportunity to create this thing and that's one of the nicest trips I've ever had I really enjoy expeditions or even days in the mountains where we do actually have to dump the plan because circumstances don't allow and then you simply stand in this environment with the skill set that you've got and the equipment you've got and think okay what should we do where should we go it's such fun when you talk about you know, you've been on you've been on the biggest mountains in the world. You've 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 been out there taking on these different challenges, and you've talked about risks and it being risky, and how you've always been quite quite careful. You know, you never you've never been injured. How do you evaluate risk when you are in these high stress environments? There is the potential for for errors, for mistakes, for the environmental conditions. How do you go about evaluating risk and how have you applied that into your sort of almost everyday life? Hmm. Well, I think risk comes... Well, risk is interesting as a concept because it exists on two axes. So there's the issue, there's objective risk, which is the stuff that's about your environment. It's about a slope, a snow slope that is avalanche prone and that can be potentially triggered by your own body weight if you, if you cross it. Uh, it's about rockfall coming from above. It's about the storm sweeping in. Those are things you can't stop, and you have to learn how to see them or see the signs that indicate that they're out there. And that's a combination of kind of training, uh, whether it's book learning, whether it's going on training courses, and then experience, going out there and applying the training that you've received. Uh, and it's about keeping that training up to date. So that's something that I will do every couple of years. I'll do a new, um, uh, I'll retrain on sort of medical issues for remote locations or on 
uh, avalanche awareness, and I'll I'll read and try and keep up to date with the newest information about all of this stuff. But the other level of risk in the mountains is the personal stuff. It's you getting tired. Uh, it's me getting tired and uh, not thinking clearly, not thinking about all the ways that this might go wrong. It's about group dynamics. Groups don't always make it safer. Groups sometimes result in the person who's most cautious feeling not able to speak up when everyone else is being really gung-ho and pushy and excited and confident. And it's a constant battle to work out when you need to be more determined and disciplined and, and ambitious and when you need to listen to the voice that says, ew, I don't, I don't like this anymore. And I'm kind of interested in that gray area and how you decide when you're being too cautious and how you decide when you're being thoroughly sensible and you should back off. Because that feeds into the other kind of axis of risk, which is fear exists in – there are two kinds of fear. There's the fear that's useful, the fear that says the snow slope is unstable, the fear that says this, this rock face is too loose, I don't like this. And then there's the fear that's kind of irrational, the fear that's more personal. Oh, I can't do this. This is going to go wrong. And you start imagining all sorts of slightly hysterical, incredibly unlikely, you know, disastrous events. And you need to be able to ignore the one fear and listen to the other fear and tell the difference. And that's hard. I find exploring the gray areas in both these kinds of risks interesting. Why, how it comes back to the rest of my life? I think it comes back to trying to do that sort of pragmatic analysis. So if I look at something and think, I don't want to do this. I mean, this makes me uncomfortable. And it's like, why does it make me uncomfortable? Is there genuinely a reason here that this might go badly wrong and it's a level of consequence that I'm not prepared to take? Or is this just one of those, oh, I don't think I'm good enough. I don't want to, you know, try this and be seen not to be good enough to make it work. I, you know, one of those ones that's deeply personal fear that's unreasonable and irrational and just holding me back from something. And it's not that the climbing helps gives me answers. It doesn't. None of these things have answers. That's why they're gray areas. But I think it does help me try and step back from things and analyze them a little more rationally about what is going on, what really matters here. Should I do this or shouldn't I do this? Yeah, it's just such a, a massive, uh, massive area. Now, you, there's another challenge that you've done, which is slightly different from the rock climbing, and that was to do with dogs and dog slaying. <laughs> and I'd just be interested that is um, how that came about and why you wanted to do this. In looking for things to do, one of the ways I think about it, one of the ways that interests me is – there are, there are environments I like operating in. I'm just not that interested in deserts and jungles and being hot and sweaty and sandy and stuff. I've done a little bit of it and just like, yeah, no. I like mountains. I like snow. I like cold. I like climbing. I like getting up on top of things. So I like adventures that operate in those kinds of environments. But then I also like trying things I haven't done before. And I like taking a skill set that I've got and then expanding it into a new area and seeing how that works for me. And sometimes I'll try it and think, eh, hmm, I'm glad I tried that, but not my thing. I won't be doing that again. And sometimes I do it and go like, yeah, yeah, more of that. That works. So I'll come back to the dogs in a minute, but the expedition I did earlier this year was to Mount Logan, second highest mountain in North America. And we did it on skis. So that's combining a 6,000-meter peak. Well, it's just under 6,000. But a high-altitude peak, which I've done before. But And I've done a lot of skiing, backcountry skiing in the Alps and the Pyrenees. But I'd never put the two together. I'd never skied a big mountain. So, And I'd never climbed in the far north of North America. So that's why Logan was interesting. 
It took things I knew I liked and put them together in a new combination. And the dog sledding was a bit like that. On one hand, it's like, oh, the Arctic, it's really flat. <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm, you know, it's going to be that appealing. But on the other hand, the idea of traveling through this, this winter landscape, the idea of working with dogs, I mean, that just sounded fun. The idea of having a chance to see a little bit of the Arctic and see what I thought of it, that sounded interesting. And then it's about an opportunity. And the opportunity was meeting this woman in England, Rona, who had a good contact in Norway, who had dogs. So quite a lot of my expeditions have been that as well. It'll be a set of things that I know I'm interested in and I'm waiting for a moment. And that moment is often a person who comes into my life. Sometimes it's time. Sometimes it's money. I mean, all of these things matter, putting an expedition together. And so that's why dog sledding, because why not? Why wouldn't it be fun to have a team of, of obstreperous huskies and, and go journeying with them? And the, the lack of mountains things actually turned out to be fine because it turns out that in the Arctic, it's about the sky this enormous, ever-changing sky, and running your dog sled feels as if you're on a frozen ocean. Uh, it, so it didn't leave me wanting to, I don't know, cross Siberia with dogs or something. It wasn't that interesting, but the experience itself was fascinating, and I'm really glad I did it. And what was it like sort of working with the dogs and actually you know, being pulled along? There must have been some skills you had to learn to, to do it. Yes, in some ways it was less difficult than one might think, but partly because, I mean, these were these were trained sled dogs and the guy who bred them was with us, Vittori. And frankly, Rona and my dog teams tended to follow Vittori's team. So it wasn't as if I had to learn how to train dogs myself from scratch and, and, and then get them to follow instructions. But we are, each of us, running fully loaded sleds. So I had a team of eight dogs. I've got 100 kilos of equipment on the sled. And you're standing on the back of it. So you've got two narrow runners, so, so, so two narrow slats of wood that you're standing on with your feet. And then you've got this big hooped bar that you're holding onto with your hands. And uh, you're using your voice to instruct the dogs faster, slower, left, right. Uh, stop. The dog's on that keen on stopping. Mm -hmm. And then you've got this kind of big grappling hook break that you put into the snow to try and keep the dog stopped because they'd actually rather run than stand around. And one of the biggest problems is the dogs like running. And obviously, a 100 kilo sled plus 70 kilos of person, if the person falls off, they can run even faster. <laughs> so you cannot fall off. But the slats you stand on are really quite slippy. And sometimes you're running on uneven ground. You're going up the side of a, of a hill. It's cambered. You can lose your footing. And then basically you dare not let go with your hands. So if you imagine Superman from the old movies, you remember stretched out with his arms in front of him, you're like that. Both hands hanging onto the sled your feet dragging in the snow, desperately trying to scrabble your feet back onto the sled. The dogs are charging off through the snow. <laughs> and if you're the last sled, and so the two, you know, Rona and Pretoria are in front and aren't going to see that you've lost your sled, you really, really don't want to let go. So, I don't know, it had a lot of funny stuff. Working with the dogs was, was fun because they're just, they're characters. These aren't, you know, nice house dogs. You can't cuddle them and pet them. These are working dogs. So it's not as if you're sleeping in a nice big fluffy pile of, of eight sweet husky dogs at night. You're not. They're chained up and they're chained so that they can't get at each other. <laughs> they can't start a big dog fight. Yeah, they've got real character. Uh, interestingly, mostly males because the males are stronger. Lead dogs tend to be female, though, because the females are brighter. Because being a, a, a dog in the team, you've just got to follow the backside of another dog. That's reasonably easy. To be the two dogs in front, because these are, these are pairs, having to run into a white wilderness, that's hard. Dogs don't like it. 
So you'd often end up with a female lead pair and then male power dogs. Um, but, yeah, no, a wonderful experience, great fun. But kind of there's only so much time in life to do expeditions. And in the end, I think it's climbing that I enjoy most. There was something interesting that you said um, earlier when you were talking about expedi- expedition and, and the fact that you were waiting for a moment or waiting for an opportunity. Now, this is something that I really struggle with because I sometimes think I'm so driven or goal driven. I want to go out and I want to achieve things and I want to make them happy and I want to put plans in place. And sometimes things don't happen like that. And you've almost got to be ready to just sit back, relax and like you said, wait for that moment to appear. And I'm quite an impatient person. So how how do you wait for those moments and not try and force things to happen? Mm, it's tricky. The trouble with these sorts of projects is you need the stars to align. Effectively, you need an interesting objective. And that's probably the easiest thing to think up. There's so many potentially interesting things you could do. But then you need people to go with, uh, unless you're one of these person who can kind of do everything alone. And But I don't want to do that. I like sharing the experience, apart from the fact that it's safer and it's easier. I like share the work, share the load, share the decision-making. I like sharing the joy of the experience. But it's not that hard to find the right people. And as you get older, it gets even harder because people stop. They get married. They have real jobs. They they have children. You know, they they just they get old. Uh, so it's it, it doesn't get any easier as you get older finding people to do things with. And then as I get older, I'm also fussier. I'm less inclined to go like any stranger will do, just because I want to do this particular objective. Nowadays, it's much more. If I'm going to spend this time out there, I want to spend it with someone I like being with. So. You need the people, then you need the money. And these things aren't necessarily as expensive as people imagine. And people like Alistair Humphreys have done an amazing job of promoting the idea of micro-adventures, small adventures that don't have to cost a great deal of money. But the fact remains is you do need some money. Uh, And that's got to come from somewhere, and it's money you're not spending on something else. And then you need the time. And that's harder as you get older as well. And the more money you earn, almost invariably, the less time you have, the more free time you have, the less money you're probably earning, the less you can spend on these, these ideas. I've chosen a, a freelance life, uh, self-employed, which is brilliant. But it means when I go away on expedition, not only am I spending money on the expedition, I'm losing money because I'm not available to do my work. I'm losing clients because I wasn't there and they had to find somebody else. So it feels like a double whammy financially when I do trips. Yeah. And, yeah, it's hard. I don't think it ever stops being hard unless you're somehow a trust fund baby. And, and you know, for some people who manage to marry the right person and therefore they've got a, a kind of a built-in adventure companion, that works. But if, if, if you didn't or if you and your partner you know, like slightly different things, the search for the right person to do it with is goes on forever. And so I think that's why I'm these days I'm more interested in kind of the stars aligning than in I've got one big mission and I will fulfill this mission. And I work on making the stars align. I mean, I work on looking for partners, expanding my network, thinking of interesting things to do, putting money aside. But I also allow serendipity to happen and then be prepared to take it. The Nanga Parbat trip, the leader of the expedition, who's a guy I know and I've climbed with before, just sort of got hold of me in January and said, you know, I've been trying to climb this mountain for several years now. We're thinking about having another go this year. I know you're pretty good at running money. I know you're pretty good at running communications on expeditions. If that's kind of a skill set we could do with, are you interested? And this was January, and they were going out in May. Like, new route, 8,000-meter peak. I thought I'd finished. I'd, I was done with 8,000-meter peak climbing. Pakistan, new route, people I like. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, not necessarily the, 
you know, the way I would have thought of thinking about a new route trip to an 8,000 meter peak, but it was a now or never offer. So I took it. Awesome. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you, which is, which is awesome. It's, some, it's taking advantage of those, those opportunities. So just a few quick questions. So one would be, do you have, do you have like a motto or a mantra or a mission of how you live your life or? Mm, no. No, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not terribly good at, at that sort of thing. I think of it as a journey and it's so, and I'm, I'm interested in making that journey as interesting as possible. And I think of it maybe as like floating down a river. I don't think of my life as, as, or of life as being something that I'm completely in control of. So much happens that, you know, it's got nothing to do with me, the state of the economy, the changes of the weather, the, the people I meet in my life. So, so much of it is just random. So it's like a river. I don't have complete control of where this river is going, but I'm doing my best to paddle down it in ways that are fruitful, interesting, fulfilling. So, yeah, it's about, it's about journey. It's about opportunity. Uh, it's about building a skill set that gives me the flexibility to make the most of the, the opportunities that come my way. Absolutely. Fantastic. Now, Kathy, you have written a couple of books. Um, do you just want to share your books and where would be the best place for people to find out more information about you? So the, the fun book is called Just for the Love of It. It's the story of my four Everest expeditions and why I kept going back to Everest, even though I wasn't particularly invested in Everest. And I called it Just for the Love of It because I was so sick of people mostly men, writing books called things like Killer Mountain and The Death Zone and, you know, God. Uh, we do actually do this because it's fun. I do it because I love it. And I wanted kind of to talk about that while also sharing some of the difficulty of, of these of a mountain like Everest. I wanted to write a book that was, that was kind of more emotionally honest and less just about the technical challenge of climbing a big mountain. Uh, so that's that's just for the love of it. You can find it on Amazon, um, my website, kathyodow.com. But my fun stuff tends to happen on my Facebook or Instagram. That's where all the photographs are of, of the current things I'm doing. And uh, just doing a search for my name on either Facebook or Instagram will we'll, we'll come up with those. Awesome. And what's, what's next for you? What's going to be your next challenge or your next adventure that you're off on? <laughs> Well, the trouble with this year is I've already done two big trips this year. The one was to Mount Logan. So this was the ski mountaineering expedition. And then I spent five weeks rock climbing in the United States, which was a brilliant low-key trip in Idaho and Wyoming, just climbing big multi-pitch rock routes uh, with one of my favorite climbing partners. So now I kind of need to do some work and earn some money because, <laughs> you know, you just, yeah. It's all very well spending your time doing fun stuff, but it doesn't really pay the mortgage. So <clears throat> the rest of this year is going to have to be about being a bit more focused on, on other things. Next year, I don't know yet about next year. I've got a couple of ideas. I'm a little bit torn between the work needed to do another expedition. You know, a lot gets invested into it beforehand. And just the easy pleasure of doing more stuff close to home. There's so much to do in Europe. The Pyrenees, the Alps, Spain, France, there's just so much good rock climbing, ski mountaineering, adventuring that can be done there. So I end up flip-flopping between doing expeditions and thinking, no, I'm going to spend a year close to home and just, you know, do lots and lots of fun stuff in my backyard. Not sure what 2017 is going to bring yet. And that's fine. And that's fine. I mean, there's a great, there's a really great, not a quote necessarily, but words on your website, which says, do what has never been done before, tackle the unknown. So I'm sure whatever you do, <laughs> it will be absolutely awesome. But Kathy, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast and sharing more about your, your different adventures, talking to us about the journey, facing the fear, dealing with, dealing with failure and, and doing what you do just for the love of it which is absolutely 
inspirational and you're such an incredible role model for for all of the women out there so thank you so much for for sharing your story with us it's been an absolute pleasure Hello tribe, how are you all doing? I hope you had a wonderful, wonderful weekend. I know I did and apologies if I'm going to go on about it, but this weekend has been absolutely epic. So I just want to share with you what I've been up to and who I've been catching up with. So on Friday, I um, headed down to Bristol for the Women in Adventure Expo and we actually had a Tough Girl Tribe meet up on the Friday night, which was absolutely awesome. So if you're new to the podcast and you're thinking, what's the Tough Girl Tribe? The Tough Girl Cr- Tribe is a closed Facebook group that I set up to encourage the listeners of the podcast so you guys to reach out and and to connect with each other, to meet similar-minded people, to discuss your ambitions, your dreams, your goals, your desires, those little secret niggles that you've of things that you want to do. But if you mention it to maybe the friends that you've got around, you might be like, what is she talking about? Why would she want to go and do that? The tribe is all about supporting other women in their adventures, their challenges and and their life. So we had our first social, which was absolutely awesome. So there's about eight of us all just catching up, having a few drinks, having a bite to eat. And the conversation was awesome. It was talking about triathlons. It was talking about travel to South America. It was talking about how do you balance family? How do you balance the money? Where do you get the money from to do these adventures? And it also gave me loads of, um, ideas and suggestions of ways that I can take the podcast and also getting you know feedback about how the podcast is going and how it's inspired people from listening to say Paris um, Edwards um, episode to then go and do a triathlon so it's it, I found it really really inspirational it's just amazing to put names to faces and to meet people in real life instead of just in in the virtual world so I do apologize to everybody who's not UK based and and who we haven't managed to connect with yet but I'm sure in the future tough the tough girl tribe will go global and when I start traveling, I'd love to come and meet you all wherever you are, whether that's Australia or America or in the other 130 odd countries that you're all based. But the reason I was down in Bristol was for the Women in Adventures Expo. Now, I actually attended this last year when it first came out. It was, um, it's a, it, yeah, so in 2015, it first started. So it went back again this year and it was bigger and better even if that is possible. But we just had some awesome speakers there. So let me just quickly tell you about the Women in Adventure Expo. So what it is, is they are the first and the only adventure and travel expo in the UK dedicated to women. And it's all about empowering women who are interested in or currently engaged in adventure and exploration. So we had the awesome Anna McNuff, who if you haven't listened to her episode on the Tough Girl podcast, please do go back and have a listen. Anna was being the host and she also did a presentation as well. My biggest challenge was actually trying to decide which, who do I go and hear speak? Because I've, I've interviewed quite a few of the women and then there was new speakers there. And I was like, oh, I was literally being pulled in so many different directions. But the talks were absolutely um absolutely awesome. I got to meet and listen to Elsie Downing about her adventure around running the 5,000 miles around the UK. So she, she'll be someone we'll be getting on the podcast. But she talked around the planning of it and and the mindset and overcoming the the fears, which for her are things like cows in fields. And um, it was really, really great to meet her. And I saw she put up this photo of her planning, which was about sort of three lines of squiggles. And I think it all sort of comes down to, you know, who you are as a person. Are you one of these meticulous planners or are you not? Because you know what? There's no right or wrong answer. I'm personally, I do love planning, but equally, is also having that balance where you don't plan every last minute and you leave things to to life and to the universe and to see what happens. Lois Price was amazing. Molly Hughes. So Molly Hughes was the youngest woman or youngest British climber ever to stand on the top of Mount Everest. Absolutely awesome story. If you haven't heard about her tattoo yet, um, amazing. Um, I feel bad I've said that now. I feel as I need to explain it a little bit more. But Molly, in order to raise money for adventure, did a... Um, had a raffle and she wanted to have a really, really awesome raffle prize. So she ended up selling off one of her bum cheeks for a tattoo. So when we get Molly on the podcast, I'll let her tell you more about this. This is the other big problem I have now. I've got so many more women I want to interview from, um, from Molly to Elsie to Becky. So uh, Becky Coles, um, who's a full-time adventurer and independent traveler. Um, There was also Lindsay uh, McLaurin. I hope I'm saying her her name right, but started off as a skateboarder. 
and won this amazing competition. So truly, truly inspiration. I could actually end up talking about the Women in Adventure Expo for such, such a long time. But please do go check it out. It's um, women womensadventureexpo.co.uk. You can follow them on Twitter at WAE. XPO, so Women Adventure Expo. Well, we're checking out. They had amazing sponsors as well. And I always think like Low Alpine was one of the sponsors. <clears throat> Excuse me. Rab was one of the sponsors. And it always impresses me when these are the companies who are getting involved with women's sports and women's adventures because you just don't see it normally. And I know a lot of women have such issues with sponsorship. So it's good to see big companies putting their hands in the pocket. I'm sorry, and Ellis Brigham as well was there as well and helping to support um to support women in adventure. So that was an amazing day on Saturday. I actually, it started at nine o'clock and finished about five. You could do yoga at the beginning, do yoga at the end. I was just so busy trying to talk to so many people and and um, just meet other listeners of the podcast as well. So hello to everybody. Thank you so much for everyone who came up to me. It was like, oh my God, I recognize your voice. It's like, yeah, you listen to the podcast. Um, my voice is going really high then. Um, so I came back and, you know, I was absolutely drained, but in a really good way. I felt as though I just had so many more ideas and suggestions and plans and things that I, I could do personally, but also things that I could do for Tough Girl Challenges that I could do for the podcast and how I can really help to support other women doing that. So I'll, I'll be sharing some of my ideas um, in the in the Tough Girl Tribe and also on my website. So go and check it out, toughgirlchallenges.com. There's also all of the show notes and everything um, else on there that you could possibly want. So as well as doing the Women in Adventure Expo, I also got given the opportunity to go and do the Commando Challenge, which you'll have heard me talking about. And it's um, held at the Royal Marines um, down in Exeter. So it's about an hour and a half drive from Bristol. So they gave me a complimentary place, which was really, really awesome of them. And two other members of the tribe came along, Cassandra and Jojo. Thank you, guys. It was awesome to have you with me. So we drove down on very early on Sunday morning for our 10 o'clock start. And one of my biggest debates was, I'm. you all know, you've heard me talk about this, I hate the cold. And I was having this massive debate, like, do I wear a wetsuit? And I know that sounds ridiculous, but I was just thinking, if I... If I go, if I get cold and wet halfway through the course, so we were doing a t- the 10K distance, I know my lips are going to go blue. I know I'm going to go hypothermic. And everybody I'd spoken to says, oh, you can't wear a wetsuit. You're going to overheat. You know, you, we're gonna, you're going to need to be revived halfway round. You know, don't do it. Don't do it. And in the end, I just thought, you know, what? I've actually got to make this decision for me. And I'd rather, rather be really too hot than too cold. And it was the best decision I've ever made. Running around the course, I'm sure Cassandra and Jojo were just like, can Sarah stop talking about how happy she is in her lovely warm wetsuit? But it was absolutely amazing. And um, so it was 10K and there was another lady as well. So there was the three of us who were going to be doing it. And this lady called Jean, so she's 49 years old and she was just in a car and she came over and said, oh, are you guys doing the 17K? And we were like, oh no, we're just doing the 10K. And she's like, oh, all my friends have bailed on me. So we were like, oh, you know, come and join us. So we scooped up um, sort of a stray, as you will. And so there was four of us on it. Um, We were just really relaxed. We weren't going after any time or anything. We just wanted to go and have fun. And it was a glorious day. It was a beautiful setup. The skies were blue. The sun was shining. And we headed out. And it was just stunning. Really, really a beautiful area. Lovely place to run in wasn't I don't think it was a particularly challenging course into comparison to um so I did tough guy in Wolverhampton in January um a few years ago which was brutal um in terms of the course there was lots of sort of tunnels and going underground and I'll talk to you a little bit as well about the sheep dip but the tunnels underground what I really liked was actually when we were going through all of the girls especially was were talking to each other it was you know five more meters the tunnel's going to the left straight on it's then going to the right keep your head down everyone's doing really well there was lots of positivity lots of conversation which was which was just really really awesome Now, the biggest challenge, the one that that most people get really, really scared about is called the sheet dip. And I've I've done something similar before, which is where you're sort of going underwater and going through a tunnel. Now, I've never gone through a tunnel before. Normally, it's like wooden um, slits. And so it's easy enough to get your head out. And so this is actually quite different when you're sort of stood there and you've got the Marines basically saying a face, right, hold your hands up here, head to your neck, go down. Just go straight through, don't kick, and we will push you through. 
And it, this is one of these obstacles where it is mind over matter because you can outthink it. And in the end, I was just like, be a pencil, be a pencil. So I put my hands down, stretched out. I did kick. So I am very sorry to the poor Marine who I probably end up kicking his poor hands away. Um, got through the other side. It was absolutely awesome. And what was amazing was was Jean was there as well. All the, Cassandra and Jojo smashed it, got through as well, did really, really well. Um, Jean was, I could see that she was struggling. You could see the fear in her in her eyes and um and he was explaining it to her and she was listening and she'd take a deep breath and go and then she'd stop and it was because she was almost thinking too much so I was trying to you know trying to encourage her I was really hoping to, for her to get through and then she just went for it and she did it and she came out the other side and it was just amazing to see she'd overcome this fear and kept, came out the other side and it was like yes 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 and this is what it's all about this is why you need to do challenges this is why you need to put yourself in these uncomfortable situations whatever they may be whether it is a 5k whether it's an obstacle course race whether it is joining the local gym whether it is picking up some weights and doing weightlifting or applying for a new job or saying yes to that opportunity it's about getting that uncomfortable it's about that feeling of challenge and changing yourself and growing and learning and um and developing so that was absolutely um that was absolutely awesome to see so we had we had a really really great time so thoroughly enjoyed it then I got up at ridiculous o'clock on Monday morning so I was up at like half five to drive back home and I have just uploaded my book onto Amazon so I'm sure you will have heard over the previous podcast about my the next biggest challenge I faced which was actually writing my book so I finished it it's just under 200 pages excuse me it's broken down into into four different parts. So the first part is just the introduction, a bit more about my story, why I decided to leave banking, how I got into running, and why I wanted to do the MDS, and how it all sort of, and how Tough Girl Challenges came about as well, and and how that was sort of an, an amalgamation of all my sort of my passions. So part two is about the training, how I messed up, which if you've heard a couple of my podcast episodes previously, you'll know that I'm massively overtrained. I ended up becoming very, very ill. I was sort of bed bound. I was, you know, I had like adrenal fatigue. I was exhausted. I was, I was just burnt out. And then the recovery process and what I did to get better and the things that I had to change, such as my diet, getting into journaling. Part three is about the actual race. And this is where I, I talk through that long stage, what was going through my head, the challenges I faced. And then part four, this is a really, really big section, actually. Part four, I wanted to take it step by step and sort of almost go through the steps that I went to. So the first step was generally fear. Most people have this fear of doing something different. And it gives you some tips of how you can face that fear and use that fear in a positive way. I then go on to talk about, you know, planning, goal setting, setting smart goals. And a lot of these things you can apply in your own life to different challenges. So it doesn't have to be to the MDS. You can apply the techniques that I talk about in there to your to your life as well. Another key area is the mental strategies. I talk about visualization, breaking things down, certif- you know, creating your own certificate of achievement. What other things that you can do to get yourself mentally in a really, really strong position? So tons and tons of information. Um, Selena McCall, who's going to be coming on the podcast in November. So she was the first British woman back from the MDS. She wrote she wrote an awesome blog about it. So I've included her blog as well so you can read about all about her experience as well it's from a different perspective different training background she's a mother of two she's 42 years old never run an ultra before so a very sort of interesting story there's also dr laura gosh as well I hope I'm pronouncing your surname right as well, Laura. Um, but myself and Laura were actually, we first connected back in 2014 when I was going to do the MDS in 2015. So Laura ran the MDS in 2015. Um, she's a doctor. She's a personal trainer. She's an incredible ultra endurance athlete. And she's also written a blog about it as well. So I've included her blog. There's also tips and advice from... Um, Elizabeth Barnes, who in 2015 was the MDS winner, uh, Megan Hines, uh, Roy Coleman as well, and um, some advice from James Cracknell, which, so, which I've taken from listening to their talks at the MDS Expo. So there is a ton of information. I've worked incredibly hard on this book. So I really do hope you go and buy it on Amazon. It's an ebook. It's for you to download and um, for you to read. We talked a lot um, 
well, not a lot, but we, you know, money did come up. And actually, it's a question I got asked quite a lot this weekend. It's like, well, you know, how do you support yourself at the moment? So what I do at the moment is I have um, a few things happening. So I'm a regional interviewer for Camp America. So you may have heard about Camp America. You go off over to the States and you work with uh, work with children over there. So I interview people who want to do that program. And I've been doing that for a number of years. I do um, speaking gigs. So I go and give motivational talks in schools, um, corporations, the guides, the brownies, whoever will have me. I do now charge for my for my talks, um, but I'm always willing to to negotiate a price for charity. Um, what else do I do? I also work um, with children as well in a youth format. So the NCS, the National Citizenship Service, I've volunteered over the summer, but I got paid for it um, working with um, working with children. And then I also have my books. I've written two other books, Climbing Kilimanjaro, or Kilimanjaro Tips for the Top, and Shallow Hosting, Your Step-by-Step Guide. But generally how I fund the podcast is actually you guys fund it, um, which is amazing. I couldn't do it without you. So I have I think it's about 12 supporters now on Patreon who all donate between $2 a month and up to $20 a month. You can go higher than that. And that makes such a huge difference. So every month at the moment, I just get under $100, which is awesome. It pays for the website. It pays for the for the media hosting it pays for all the other bits of technological stuff that you need to do with the podcast like running it through audacity to improve the sound quality and that makes a massive difference so i couldn't do this um without you guys it is a lot of work involved i was explaining that you know sometimes it can take me six hours to edit a podcast depending on who the guest is and it all obviously does take time but equally I love what I do. I'm very passionate about, I hope you realize how passionate I I am about what I do and why I do it. Um, and, and I want to do more of it. I want to put more episodes out, especially, you know, attending the women in adventure expo, you just realize how many awesome women are out there and their stories are not being heard. They're not being shared. And I'm doing my utmost to change that. And I know it's creating this ripple effect because from speaking to from speaking to you, from engaging with you on Twitter, you um, engaging with you from the emails you send me, you are starting blogs, you're starting your own podcast, you're going out there and doing the challenges that you want to do. And when you do that, you inspire your partner, you inspire your children, you inspire your friends around you. And your friends will start thinking, well, oh, if she's going to do that, well, maybe I should do that. And this is the ripple effect it spreads it gets bigger so i'd love you to buy my book so please do please do go check it out tough girl sahara challenge available on amazon all the links will be um through my website as well um i hope you enjoy i'd love to get your feedback on it and if you've got any questions and you're thinking about doing the mds then please do send me an email sarah at toughgirlchallenges.com Com. But otherwise, have a fantastic week. I'm sure there's loads more stuff that I could have talked about. I feel as I've missed out loads of stuff of people I need to thank and um, uh, people I need to sort of say hello to. But I feel as though I've been talking for quite a long time now. So um, thank you to everybody who does listen to the podcast. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for writing reviews. Thank you for tweeting about it. Thank you for telling your friends. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being inspired. And thank you for going out there and doing the challenges. This is what makes the difference. And my stock phrase, if it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. So keep on challenging yourself. Have an awesome week. And I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another episode of the Tough Girl Podcast every Tuesday at 7am. 